As a curator at the Birmingham Museum of Art, I'm often contacted by members of the general public asking for additional information about a work of art. What is it? Who made it? What's it worth? What should I do with it? These are just a few of the questions I typically hear. But the question I'm asked more than any other is, is it real? In other words, is it authentic? Since the Antiques Roadshow premiered in this country in 1997, more and more Americans want to find out if the vase they inherited from a rich aunt or the painting they picked up at a thrift store is a priceless original. My colleagues and I consider these so-called curatorial consultations an important part of our jobs, though I admit that I occasionally feel overwhelmed by the sheer volume of inquiries that I receive. We're careful to avoid conflicts of interest by not attaching monetary value to the works that we examine, and we stress that it's simply an opinion based, based upon a brief assessment. Now, sometimes I do have the pleasure of telling someone that their $3 thrift store find is an important work by an important artist. But usually, I'm in the unenviable position of telling them that the painting they hoped would put their children through college is nothing more than a poster print. <laughs> Although I have a PhD in art history, it's in moments like these that I feel more like an MD delivering some dreadful diagnosis. <laughs> this is even more so the case in those instances, and this is true, when my opinion has elicited anger or even tears. Just like a real doctor, it's important to have a good bedside manner and deliver the diagnosis with sensitivity and respect. Fortunately for me, the tearful and angry patients have been few and far between. Typically, people just want to share the story of a cherished family treasure or how they came to own an interesting work of art. For those of you who watch the Antiques Roadshow, think about the feedback booth at the end of every episode where guests can share their stories or even their surprises. Even when the monetary diagnosis isn't good, most guests leave grinning ear to ear. Of the hundreds of curatorial consultations I've done over the past seven and a half years, there's one that I'll never forget. In the fall of 2006, shortly after arriving at the Birmingham Museum of Art, I received a phone call from a woman who lived in a remote area of rural Alabama. She informed me that she owned a painting by the American landscape painter George Innes, a rather large painting that had been in her family for nearly 50 years and that she had inherited from her father. Now, I was understandably skeptical at the idea that a painting by one of the foremost 19th century American landscape painters might be hiding in a remote corner of Alabama. And I wasn't exactly thrilled about taking a drive out into the country to look at something that I was sure would turn out to be a worthless print. The woman explained that the painting had never been examined by an expert, and she asked if I might come and have a look. I initially tried to avoid this by asking her if she could bring the painting to the museum, but she explained that it was far too cumbersome for her to move that it was nearly five feet tall and that it was framed under a heavy oak frame and under a massive piece of uh, picture glass. I asked how her father had come to own the work and she told me that the painting used to hang in a public school in Pinellas County, Florida, where her father had been a maintenance worker. One day he noticed that the painting had been set out on the curb with the trash and was about to be thrown out. And so her father asked the school's principal if he could have the painting, and the principal uh, responded that for one dollar, it could be his. Now the words Pinellas County caused my ears to perk up because I remember that in his later career, George Innes maintained a winter home in the town of Tarpon Springs, Florida, which is in Pinellas County. With these two words, Pinellas County, the caller's supposed Innes went from a no way in hell, <laughs> to a, well, maybe. Intrigued enough to warrant the drive and the time away from the office, I concluded the phone call by, by making an appointment to view the painting just a few days later. 
On the appointed day, after a long drive, I arrived at the caller's home and I was led into a back bedroom where the painting hung above a small table. As described, it was in a large oak frame under a very heavy piece of uh, picture glass. And from the style and appearance of the frame, I could tell that it dated from the late 19th century. I also discovered that it wasn't painted on canvas, but rather on the largest piece of professional artist board that I had ever seen, which accounted for some of its tremendous weight. And then there was the painting itself. It was beautifully rendered, clearly the work of a professional artist and not at all by an amateur or a Sunday painter, as we like to call them. It looked very much like other paintings by George Innes that I had seen with my own eyes, and particularly the color palette, and it had the tall, almost branchless pine trees that one finds in many of his Tarpon Springs pictures. Then lastly, in the lower right-hand corner, there was the signature. It was signed G. Innes, 1893, in a manner that was plausibly by the hand of the master himself. Things were getting interesting. Not only did this look like an Innes, but the materials, the large piece of professional artist board, the large heavy oak frame, the huge sheet of picture glass were all very expensive and in line with what a professional artist like George Innes would have used. Now, of course, my host was eager to hear my impression of the picture, but faced with the prospect of a major discovery, I decided that it was important to proceed with caution. I told the woman that I thought that there was enough here to warrant further investigation, and I asked if I might take a few pictures to study back at my office. I hightailed it back to Birmingham as quickly as I could. <laughs> and in the museum's library, I consulted our extensive holdings of books on George Innes. And in one particular uh, catalog, I was excited to discover a painting that corresponded almost exactly to the picture I had just seen, except that it had a somewhat more finished appearance and it was an, a smaller oil on canvas picture. I decided in my mind that the picture I had just seen must be the study for this finished work. However, artists usually paint smaller studies for larger finished works, not the other way around. Still, I thought there must be some plausible explanation for this size dif differential, and I was undeterred by my mounting belief that there was probably something special here. However, I had reached the limits of my own expertise on the artist George Innes. Despite having more than a layman's familiarity with the artist's life and work, I'm by no means the world's leading authority on the artist. That distinction is actually held by a scholar named Michael Quick, a former curator at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the author of the George Innes Catalogue Raisonné which is a two-volume, more than 1,100-page compendium of the artist's known works. Michael knows more about George Innes than any person living or dead, except maybe for George Innes himself. <laughs> now, as luck would have it, Michael Quick is the, art advisors to one of our, is the art advisor to one of our trustees, and he was already planning a trip to Birmingham. I contacted Michael Quick, sent him my photos, and told him the story of the painting and how it had originated in Pinellas County, Florida, and he agreed to look at the painting during his upcoming visit. The museum's preparatory staff retrieved the painting from its owner, unframed it, and placed it on a large canvas in preparation for Michael's arrival. Our director, Gail Andrews, trustee Nan Skyer, and her husband, Dr. David Skyer, and I were all present for Michael Quick's examination of the work. He slowly and methodically walked us through the paintings, the painting and its materials, confirming my suspicion that the frame, the artist's board, the large sheet of picture glass were all expensive and all in line with what a professional artist of George Innes's considerable stature would have used. He talked about the subject matter, classic Innes, particularly the foliage, and he shared with us the story of how Innes's admirers used to sit at his feet and watch him paint leaves. 
He brought a transparency of the smaller oil on canvas painting, and there was a distinct similarity in the color palettes of the two works. Things were looking very, very promising. And then he turned to Dr. David Skyer, an eye surgeon, and he said, in your line of work, you're not allowed to have a bad day. Artists do have bad days, but George Ennis never had a day as bad as this. In an instant, my hopes were dashed. Not the work of George Ennis. And Michael Quick determined that the painting must be uh, a copy after an early photo reproduction of the smaller oil on canvas work. Copies of George Ennis's works were, are not at all uncommon. After all, he was a very popular painter and imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now, I wish I could tell you that I was undeterred by uh, Michael Quick's expert opinion and that I eventually uh, proved that in fact this was the work of George Ennis. After all, the art world is full of anecdotes where people did exactly that. Take, for example, the longtime New York art dealer Ira Spanierman. In 1968, Ira Spanierman spotted a painting of a bearded Italian gentleman at an auction in New York. He didn't know what the picture was, but uh, he said that he felt good about it, and so he bought it for just $325. The painting was quite grimy, and so he took it to a restorer to be cleaned. And that restorer found on the back a small paper label indicating that the painting had once been exhibited as the work of the Italian Renaissance master, Raphael. Convinced of the painting's quality and with this old attribution to go on, he set out to prove that this was, in fact, by Raphael. Three years later, thanks to new scholarship and x-rays, experts confirmed that he was in possession of a lost masterpiece, Raphael's 1518 portrait of the Florentine ruler, Lorenzo de' Medici. In 2007, Mr. Spanierman sold that painting at Christie's for $37.3 million. <laughs> Not bad for a $325 investment. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that the story of the Innes from rural Alabama ends with a multi-million dollar auction sale. We returned the painting to its owner, and I had to break the bad news. Now, you're probably all wondering why I'm sharing a story with you that probably seems to almost all of you as a professional disappointment. After all, I wasted a lot of my own time and effort, as well as the time and effort of many of my colleagues to follow up on a hunch that proved to be incorrect. I decided to share this with all of you today because it taught me about a different type of authenticity, one that has nothing whatsoever to do with monetary value. When I called the owner of the work to break the bad news, she was understandably disappointed that she didn't own an authentic Innes. After all, who wouldn't like to win the lottery? But she took the news very well. And she told me that the painting had been part of her family for a very long time, that it had meant a great deal to her father, and therefore meant a great deal to her and her family. It was at that moment I realized that even though the painting wasn't authentic as the work of George Innes, it was nevertheless authentic as a work of art, and as such had the same potential to provide someone with an authentic experience. Now, museums follow a fairly rigid definition of authenticity. In order for a work to be considered authentic, it needs to be made by the artist, made under the artist's supervision, or authorized by the artist's estate. Even the most vigilant artists have a very difficult time safeguarding their works from un unauthorized reproductions. Take, for example, the American sculptor Frederick Remington. Remington copyrighted all of his bronze sculptures and kept meticulous records as to their, uh, the whereabouts of authorized pieces. Remington died in 1909, and his widow, Eva, continued to authorize casts to be made until her own death in 1918, whereupon she ordered the casting molds to be destroyed. However, Remington was such a popular artist that unauthorized reproductions were made both during and after his lifetime 
many of them made by the very same foundry, Roman bronze works, that he had entrusted to reproduce his work and safeguard it from copyright infringement. For many years, the Birmingham Museum of Art believed that it had 12 authentic Remington bronzes in its permanent collection. The prize among these was a work known as Coming Through the Rye, which was on more or less permanent view in the American gallery and was very beloved by our patrons. Then in the 1990s, two Remington experts evaluated our entire collection independently and reached identical conclusions. Of the 12 Remington bronzes in our collection, only five were authentic. Among the unauthorized or inauthentic casts was our cast of Coming Through the Rye, which one of the experts called a particularly poor casting of spurious quality. <laughs> Noting that in authentic casts, six hooves support the piece, but then in ours, incredibly, seven hooves touch the base. <laughs> now, based on this expert uh, uh, testimony, we removed the uh, sculpture from the American Gallery. Very recently, I asked a New York dealer what he, what he thought I should do with this sculpture, and he replied, do you know a boat that needs an anchor? <laughs> now, even though this work has not been on view for nearly 20 years, I'm still asked by patrons about its whereabouts, and they tell me how much they miss it. And they also ask, why can't we continue to exhibit it? Isn't it a real sculpture? Didn't we used to exhibit it? Doesn't it kind of look like the real thing? <laughs> these are valid questions. But what these questions have, have taught me is that our patrons' enjoyment of this work has nothing whatsoever to do with its authenticity. They can have genuine enjoyment of a fake. Now, further evidence of this might be found in the fact that all of you can go to Sam's Club and find even worse reproductions of Remington's bronzes, including coming for, through the rye, for just a few hundred bucks. And even though these works aren't authentic from the point of view of connoisseurship, I'm sure the pleasure they give their owners is real in every way. I think it's likely that our cast of Coming Through the Rye will reappear in the American galleries. As a curator and an art historian, I can use it as a teaching tool to talk about issues of authenticity and connoisseurship and quality. And for those who read my label, they'll understand that this is not an authorized cast, not authentic, and not up to Remington standards in the slightest. But I'm sure most people won't bother to read the label, and they'll simply be happy to see an old friend after a 20-year hiatus. And there's nothing wrong or inauthentic about that. Every day, as a curator, I get to have countless meaningful interactions with works of art that have nothing whatsoever to do with their monetary value. And so I challenge each of you to scour your basements and your attics and your jewelry boxes and your hope chests and find your own meaningful experience with a work of art. And if you're not happy with what you find there or don't find anything at all, go to flea markets, go to tag sales, go to auctions. You probably won't find a, an Innes or a Raphael or a Remington, though you never know but you'll develop an eye for what you enjoy. And you'll have great stories to tell of velvet Elvises and dogs playing poker. <laughs> and you'll meet a lot of genuine characters along the way. And if you ever want to share those stories with someone, you know where to find me. Thank you.